How important is police familiarity and training with different ethnicities in how they respond to situations? Have you seen any evidence that supports theories that allude to the fact that cultural insens insensitivity leads to negative responses and outcomes? So what I see as kind of like the important research on this topic is, is emerging now because it goes back to implicit bias. What do we really mean by that? And, and again, earlier I shared an example. So other people can sit back and hopefully feel comfortable sharing their examples to their life. Then also the idea of, you know, cultural competency. What do we mean by that? Cultural insensitivity. What do we mean by that? Right. And so we can break it down kind of in the research. We're saying, you know, we can title, I think, in one of my articles, I called it something like cultural insensitivity. Well, if you are forcing the word addict or alcoholic, you are creating a norm where your participants must identify themselves as an addict or therefore they're not making progress. That may be culturally incompetent practice for African Americans based on, on our findings. So, Here's my thoughts on this. The real research about implicit bias and what do we mean by cultural insensitivity and, and cultural sensitivity, it's emerging because I don't think we've defined it yet. I do the equity and inclusion training for the National Association of Drug Court Professionals. And when I say I do it, I'm one of many faculty. And part of the curriculum is addressing cultural competency, cultural insensitivity, implicit bias. The moment that we use those words, implicit bias, privilege, in culture, in, in, in cultural insensitivity, what it tends to do is create defensiveness in people where they're not wanting, they've checked out. And what I've found, and this is strictly from my experience, the defensiveness tends to come from people who look like me. And here would be an example of that. And, 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 and I know that your question tied into policing, right? When it comes to policing, we need to be able to have real conversations about implicit bias where police officers are taken through a process where they can actually identify their implicit biases. Like I did an implicit bias that I related uh, when I was growing up, I talked about earlier. We're not doing that in my experience. We're going to police stations and saying, yeah, we're gonna do a training on cultural competency and it's artificial, it's vague, it's not real, it's not specific. And people actually leave there worse off, more defensive than when they came into the training. I traveled the country, I was in Seattle, couple months ago, I'll be in New Northern New York in March. I'll be uh, in Cleveland next month, February, uh, Atlanta later in the year. I travel the country and I present my research. I talk about race in treatment courts. And I had my girlfriend with me for the very first training. With her. And I said to her, watch, I'm going to do a presentation on race. I'm going to talk about the African-American experience in treatment court through the words of African-Americans. And we're going to talk real about cultural competency and cultural, you know, uh, incompetence and implicit bias. And I said to her, I said, watch, watch what's going to happen. Cause it always happens after I'm done talking. Thank you all for attending. I'll be here afterwards. If we want to process anything or you have any questions. And I told my girlfriend this, watch what's going to happen. At the end, you're going to see two groups. And they're going to be segregated by race. You're going to see African-Americans here. And you're going to see white participants, attendees there. So how do you know that? I've been doing it long enough. Just watch. After the training, just like it's happened many, many times before, 
African American attendees, you know, professionals, those that work in criminal justice reform, are coming up to me and saying, thank you. Thank you for doing this research. Thank you for talking about this issue. We, we attend cultural competency training, but it's artificial. You gave real examples. And I always tell them, well, give the credit to the participants. All I'm doing is sharing their words. I mean, let's thank the African-Americans that I interviewed throughout this country, because it's really it's them who are giving these examples. A group of African-American attendees are saying, thank you for finally doing this. We've been talking to our court administration for a while about these issues, mandating AA meetings, using the word addict and alcoholic so freely it goes on deaf ears. Then I move to the other side. And this may even sound like I'm exaggerating. It, it is when I it is an, an, I'm talking about near fact of segregation, African Americans and white. The white attendees are coming up and they're defending the work that they do because they saw the honest, real lived experiences of African Americans as a threat to them. Wow. And they defend their work and dismiss the lived experiences of African-Americans, meaning by, by challenging, well, they said they didn't go to AA meetings. Well, maybe they just didn't go to the right AA meetings. Well, I don't know. Maybe they just want natural support systems in their life and they don't want AA meetings or even better yet options. Give them options. All participants, white, black, brand doesn't matter. So I, I, when I say we have emerging research, there's so much research and literature out there about cultural competency, implicit bias. I've read a lot of it. And then honestly, I've stopped reading it because I don't see it as getting to the real issue. Meaning if you're going to teach about implicit bias, but not help people identify their own implicit biases and then provide a safe environment for them to share it, we may cause more harm than good. Because those that become defensive with those terms, privilege, bias, right, may leave with more guards up. More guards up is just going to push that bias deeper down in the unconscious mind. Hence, more harm may, may be done. And I've done it with my own trainings that I've, I've, I've met with some people. And, and you know, I'm like, man, I, I, I really think... By them attending this training, it's caused more harm than good because they absolutely are not open to what African-Americans had to say. Now, trust me, I'm talking about a small, rare group of attendees. I believe all criminal justice reform advocates who attend my trainings and discussions, they are open and they want to learn something. But always there's a small group, African-Americans. John, thank you. We've been wanting to hear this. We see it. Thank you for finally presenting this research. And then a small group, which tends to be of white attendees, defensive, defending their work, challenging words like cultural competency, because they're just not willing to take a very real, honest look at it. And in some sense, I may have been in the same boat when I was at my last university. I was not, I was aware of my implicit biases, but I was not willing to have an open, honest conversation with students to model it for them. Now, now I am. And again, I tie that back. The, you don't have an option. And this is a great thing at Morgan State University. You better be real. You better be honest. You better be ready to have good conversations about every issue that I have experienced, students have experienced, or that we are aware of as it relates to urban communities and race.